everybody and welcome, Tom Daly here from the Academy of Financial Trading. We are about to begin your sixth lesson as part of your foundation trading program. This evening's lesson is going to focus upon the heading of technical analysis in much more detail. Tonight we're going to go in, we're going to start to explore much more of these charting setups which could lead for opportunities within the markets which we will be exploring. As with all of the webinars which we conduct, we will start out by having a look at our risk warning. So it is important that we're all aware of the risks associated with trading the financial markets, with investing, and of course with leverage. This evening's lesson, as we mentioned, is going to focus upon further charting setups. In particular, we're going to be looking at ascending and descending triangles. We're going to be exploring the average true range indicator. We're going to be combining that with oscillators and then with Fibonacci retracements, all of which are going to help us to have a much clearer picture as to where opportunities might exist in any one of the markets. So what we're going to be talking about after that is how it is the order flow, how it is the commitment of traders which essentially dictates the direction of the markets. Now if we're talking about ascending and descending triangles, the existence of these triangles, that actually means absolutely nothing without people being committed in a particular direction. So it's about orders, it's about commitment, it's never about opinion. And what we then say is, regardless of the outcome, we will react and we will look for trading opportunities. So if the market breached through a ceiling, you might look for long opportunities. If it breached through a floor, you might look for long, excuse me, for breached through a ceiling, you might look for long opportunities. Excuse me, for breached through a floor, you might look for shorting opportunities. So it is the action which is going to speak much louder than words possibly could. So let's speak about this a little bit further. It is all about that order flow. It is all about the actual movement of the price which can only exist with orders being placed at specific levels. And this is one of the reasons, again, why we like the technical analysis section so much, why we are never dependent upon fundamental analysis. Because when price is moving, it's not down to opinion. When price is moving, it doesn't care about what the news is saying. The price moves, and it is only after that fact that the news is created. Okay, so never forget that. Never be dependent upon an opinion, upon a news item, in order to dictate the flow of the markets. It's only ever going to be dictated by the actual orders which exist within that marketplace. So when we look at triangles, the very first one which we want to look at is the ascending triangle. And this is a combination of diagonal support with horizontal resistance. That's all it is. It is a market which has been pressing higher. Okay, it has been pressing the market ever so higher. The market is pressing forward, showing you the directional force which might exist in that marketplace. A descending triangle that shows you that the bears are gaining strength in that direction. So we're going to be exploring each of these triangle, each of these triangles individually. This evening will hopefully help us to see maybe a little bit of interaction, a little bit more interaction between me, between you, between the supportive team to make sure that we're all fully comfortable with what indeed is happening. So the ascending triangle, to start with, as we said, it is a combination of diagonal support and horizontal resistance. We say in this scenario that it is the bulls who are gaining strength. The bulls are quite literally taking territory. They are not allowing the bears to hit lower lows. It's a little bit like marching forward into a marketplace. We say that the bulls are more aggressive. We say that the odds would favor an upside breakout. 
but we must wait for the market to tell us what to do because the market is our ultimate indication as to whether or not we might consider taking a trade. So let's explore this a little further. I'm just going to get out my blue pen so we can all see what is happening here. Down on the area which I'm going to circuit, I'm going to label that as L. We're going to call that a low point. So L is a low point in the marketplace. And then we have the bulls are marching forward. The bulls are pressing this market all the way up to that green line. And then the bears step out and they sell off. We know that the bears are pressing the market back down because we can see the market falling from that level. It is action speaking louder than words. So the bulls from that point they have achieved right here, HL, a higher low. Does that make sense to everybody? The bulls step in at that point and they start buying back up towards that resistance point. So we have that diagonal support, we have that horizontal resistance. And then we can see it's pressing tighter and tighter and tighter. And let's imagine the scenario where all of the bears are selling at that green line, at that or resistance line. Would all of those bears, would they be in winning or losing positions if the market went above that green line to X? Would they be in winning or losing positions if the market moved up to that line of X? Let me have a look. So everybody who sold, just think of it like this. People who are selling are speculating on the market falling in value. If the market does then rise up to that level of X, would those who sold at the green line be in winning or losing positions? They would be in losing positions. Absolutely right. There are a few people who have typed in winning. There are a few people who have typed in definitely winning. Anybody who has typed in winning, unfortunately, you're on the wrong side of the trade. If you're selling at or if you're selling at that horizontal green line and the market goes up, if you're selling at that green line and the market rises, you're going to be in a losing position. Okay, if you sell something at a lower price than the price you ultimately pay for it, you're in a losing position. Okay, great stuff. We're getting there. Now, what we say is if the price goes up to such a level where it hits what we call SL, a stop loss, a stop loss level, that is where people would automatically have their orders placed to exit a trade which is working out against them. Okay? They have decided to cut their losses at that level. Okay? And there the bears might have had their stop loss level placed at that blue line. And if there is a lot of stop losses placed at that level, what ultimately could happen is if the market breached up 2x, those stop losses could have been triggered, which would push the market further up. Does that make sense to everybody? If the market went 2x, stop losses could have been triggered, which on short positions would be the opposite side, which would push the market further up. So what do you guys think we might consider doing at that level of X? What could we consider doing at that area of X? What do we think? Dean, you have it. Oscar, you have it. Paul, Giuseppe, <laughs> a lot of people getting it. Well done. You must consider going long. Because if the stop losses on shorts were to be activated at that level, couldn't we consider coming in at that area of X? We might even call that one piece of confirmation. Absolutely. Likewise, if the market broke down below this line of Y, we would still say that the market was trading outside of what we might consider to be normal. So you might look for shorts if the market broke down through that diagonal black line and it hit that level of Y. But in these instances of ascending triangles, you would say that you would favor the long side of the trade. 
and we're going to show you as we go on that no two trades should be treated equally. Essentially, the more supporting evidence, I guess the more scope or the more remish you might give a particular trade. So this is all to find pieces of confirmation. We must combine them together to try to find viable opportunities. Let's have a look at this on an actual chart, okay? This is the US dollar Swiss franc daily candlestick chart taken from the end of last year. So to begin with, what we must have are multiple touches of each line. If there wasn't multiple touches, we wouldn't have a clear area of resistance or a clear area of support. So we can, the, we can see, excuse me, in this example, that we started out with a low point. As the market moved onwards, it achieved a number of higher lows. So we have HL, a higher low, followed by a higher low, followed by a higher low, all the way up along. So you could see it was the bulls who felt they were in control of the market. They kept pushing it up to a level, a level of or a resistance point where the bears try to sell it back down, where the bears try to sell it back down. But no matter what the bears tried to do, they were never able to push it further down than the previous low point. So you could almost feel the energy build. You could see the spring beginning to tighten. You could see the triangle forming, appearing into a wedge. And then what happened? That wedge broke to the upside. The bulls took charge. As soon as we had a breakout, we had what we might call a little bit of a retest. The bears came out maybe just to test the resolve of the bulls, to try and push it back down and to see whether or not those bulls were determined enough to push the market higher. And that's what happened. There was a little retest, a little sell-off, and then the bulls came back out in strength and pushed the market further up in their favour. Can everybody see that action? Can everybody see how the price is being squeezed into a point where a decision has to be made one way or the other? Now, as we've said, an ascending triangle would normally tell us that we would favour the high side breakout, that we would favour the price to break out above that resistance point and move on higher. But as it comes into that wedge pattern, as it moves on and on, there is an almost, it's just, a, a, a suppose, a greater chance it would break to the upside, but it doesn't mean there is no chance that it would break to the low side. What it does tell us is that as that wedge tightens ever so tighter and tighter and tighter, there has to be a resolution at some point in time. Okay, at some point in time. And we do indeed use automatic orders, Christian, which will be helping you to understand a little bit further on. We'll look at another example. We'll look at Microsoft, again taken from just the end of last year, where we had the exact same type of setup. We had a low point from the, towards the end of August, a low point. Then as we progressed, we had several higher low points where again we could see the energy build, where we could see the bulls take charge. And then coming into the middle towards the end of October, we had a massive gap to the upside. G for gap. We had a huge gap to the upside. Okay? So we saw that power. We saw that power exist. We saw the bulls take charge. We saw them all jump into the market. And not just slowly press it ever so slightly higher like we saw in that previous example but literally make that massive gap, form that massive gap in the market and then push it ever so higher. And then what we saw immediately after that is we could see that history repeated itself. We could see the exact same thing was happening again. We could see there was another ascending triangle being formed. Now, what has happened in this point in time, I don't have it as part of the slides, but I was looking at this chart just today, we know that this has since actually sold off. That has moved back down to that $52, $51 area. 
So even though history repeated itself and even though another ascending triangle was formed and even though you might say that another ascending triangle, you might favour another breakout to the upside, that's not what happened in this case, which shows us why it is so important to make sure that you have orders placed to take advantage of either side of the market. And this is something which we will be coming back to a little bit more as we progress. For those who are asking about that gap, is everybody clear on how those gaps are formed? How it is, again, just that congregation of orders which pushes a market higher. How those gaps are more frequently found in the likes of these equity markets. Because the equity markets are only opened for a short window on any given day. The equity markets, normally, they're only open for six or seven hours per day. Okay. I'll give a quick run through. Some people are asking how these gaps are formed, what caused the gaps. Hands are like your answer, saying it doesn't matter how it's formed as long as it makes me money. That's okay. So, I'll give you, I suppose, a bit of an analogy, all right? Um, I, I tend to use maybe a property analogy when I'm coming to explaining these gaps. And this is a gap higher. So let's use a property example where there might be a higher gap in a property market. Again, imagine, imagine you're living in the suburb of a major city. Okay, um, you're, the suburb that you're in is maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll say that it is, say it's 45 minutes of a commute from your suburb into the city centre. Okay, and imagine that the price is in your suburb, the price for a normal, we'll say a three-bed semi-detached property in your suburb, imagine they're costing $300,000, okay? You're a 45-minute drive from the city centre, you know, a reasonable distance, you're in the suburbs, property prices are on average $300,000, okay? So imagine some weekend, some Saturday or some Sunday, your local municipal council or the government announces that they're going to spend and they're going to build a high-speed railway directly from your suburb into the city centre. No longer is it going to be a 45-minute commute. It's now going to be only 15 minutes of a commute. Imagine a 15-minute commute on a high-speed rail. What do you think that would do to property prices in your area? What do we think? It would absolutely shoot up. It would shoot up dramatically, wouldn't it? Now, would it go from 300,000 up to 301,000? Or is it more likely to go from 300,000 up to maybe 375,000? What do we think? What do we think? It would, it would jump, it would go to 300, 375, 400, 450, whatever the price may be. There would be a substantial gap in the property market. But it is simply down to supply and demand, isn't it? All of a sudden, the suburb that you're in would go from a so-so, okay, 45-minute commute to a high-demand 10 to 15-minute commute on a high-speed rail into the city centre. Okay, it would increase greatly, it would shoot up drastically, and that's what those gaps are. That's all that it is. For whatever reason, perhaps there was good economic news which came out from Microsoft overnight towards the middle to the end of October of last year, where all of a sudden people piled into the market. There was a massive amount of demand between day X and day Y. And that excessive demand just caused the price to increase and it caused that gap to occur. That's why it appears. That's why it's there. Is that okay with everybody? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, Johan, yeah, I get your point, absolutely. But I guess it's important that everybody understands gaps. It is one of the things that we get asked most frequently about. So to be honest, I don't mind it going through it again. It's absolutely fine. No worries. So it's just showing us the conviction which exists in the marketplace. So let's check out a descending triangle. These are the exact opposite, as you can think, of an ascending. These are showing us where the bears are gaining strength. So bears in these examples are winning the battle. Bears are more aggressive. Bears are showing the bulls how to trade. Okay, so let's go through this and see if we can all understand it together. We start out in this case with a high point. The bears come down and they push the market down. Then the bulls come out, we'll say at S, at that supportive line, and they try to bid the market back up. They try to push the price ever so higher. It doesn't happen. They can't 
get it above that previous high point. So they achieve a LH, a lower high. And then the bears come out again. They show their strength once more. The bulls come back out at the supportive line. And this time they can't even get it higher than the previous lower high. A new lower high is achieved. So we can see that it is the bulls who are weakening. It is the bears who are gaining strength. Okay, it is the bears who are gaining strength. So just like we saw in that previous example. If all those bulls were buying at S, at that red horizontal line, and if the market then moved down to that line, I'm going to call it this time SL, stop loss. If the market moved down to that badly drawn blue horizontal line, would those who had bought at S, would they be in winning or losing positions? If you buy at S, and if the market moves down to SL, would you be in a winning position or would you be in a losing position? Absolutely, there would be in a losing position. Anybody who had bought at a high price and the market then moves to a lower price would be in a losing position. A stop loss where people might have actively placed an order to exit the market if the price, if the market doesn't work in their favour, there could be a stack of those types of orders placed at that stop loss line. So we know if that is the case, if the market moves down to a congregation of sell orders, those sell orders being exits from the bulls losing trade, then it will just exaggerate the move. It'll push the market further down people will begin to panic they will flee the market they will exit in their droves they will push one another out of the way in order to ensure that they exit with the least amount of loss and let's see exactly how this looks in a specific market let's have a look and see how it looks in this Brent oil market, oil now trading down below $30 a barrel for the first time in well over, gosh, is it well over a decade at this stage? But we have our supportive line. So all the way through from the end of August into September into October. Did we get into November? We did. Into November of last year, we had that floor in the market around about that $47.50 area. We had the bears who were pushing the price further and further down. We can see in that area which I've circled, that red circle, we can see that initial failure. We can see the initial panic from the bulls, where the bears were able to push the market down to a level. The bulls came back out and they pushed it higher to try and retest, to try to test, excuse me, the resolve of those bears. They weren't even able to push it back up to the point from which it broke. And then we can see what happened. The market went down again to this level of X initially. And can anybody tell me maybe why it may have paused at that level of X? Why did it pause ever so briefly for three days at that level of X? Why do we think? Why do we think? Why was the trade? Why did it move down to that level? Now, what have we got? It doesn't really matter why, absolutely not. But I think it's nice to maybe ask the question because we might be able to see it on the chart. We can see it over here. That could have been seen as a previous supportive area. It could have been seen as another floor from which it was about to break. So maybe at that area of X, maybe the bulls were saying, you know what, there's a reasonable chance it'll stop. But then we can see the panic which exists when it didn't stop that it moved very, very quickly from that $42, $43 level all the way down to maybe $36 with another brief respite. And then there was a sizable sell-off day after day after day after day of a sell-off until we're now down into that $29 area, there or thereabouts. But that's all it is. It is the bears taking charge. It is the bears breaching through that floor. And when they breach through that floor, you can sense the panic which is existing. 
as long as you're able to identify that floor, you know what the bulls will do if that floor is breached. What those bulls will do is they will panic, they will flee. They will exit the market in droves. And if you're able to identify that, if you're able to then take advantage of that move, if it happens by having an order placed in the market, that is how to trade correctly, in our opinion. Let's have another look at it. We can see the same thing again in gold. I like these examples because we have on the right hand side, we have a descending triangle, which works out, you could say, as it should almost. We have a severe break to the downside. The floor is broken. But then on this right hand side, the most recent break, we had another descending triangle. But instead of the price moving down, the price actually moved back up. What we possibly are going through at the moment is again just that same type of a retest. Again, it is the bears just testing the resolve of the bulls. And once that retest is complete, one of two things can only really happen. Either the bears will test the resolve of the bulls, the bulls will give in and the price will move further down. Or the bears will test the resolve of the bulls, the bulls will stand firm and the price will move up and away. Only one of those two things can happen. So that's what's quite interesting to us. Okay, We can see in the middle we had an ascending triangle which again failed. They gave a brief little pop up through the top. That pop up, it did not last. There was a couple of signals to tell us or to tell anybody who was trading it that you mightn't have a massive amount of confidence in it. But once it broke back down below that resistance point, you can see the substance of the sell off which occurred. It's quite, I think it's quite interesting to see these examples in real life, to understand that they do occur time after time after time again, that it's not just a case of them being once every blue moon. So let's have a look. I want to get your opinion as to what is going to happen in this chart. We're looking at the Euro Swiss franc chart. OK, we're looking at the Euro Swiss franc example. The question which I have for you this evening is what would you do in this scenario? If you were looking at this chart right here, right now, what would you do in this Euro Swiss franc scenario? Would you go long? Would you go short? Or would you do something else? What would you go for in this obvious descending triangle example? Let's have a look. Absolutely, Michael, it is a certainly a descending triangle. Let me have a look. So a lot of people typing in that they would go short. That's fine. A lot of people typing in, I guess, the kind of answer which we're looking for in this scenario. You could have gone long below S. You could have gone long at L. You would say that you would favor the short because you've got that descending triangle. Now, ultimately, the moral of this story is that you should have placed your orders in both directions. Your orders should have been in both directions to catch no matter what happens in the market. And in this scenario, you can see that the market broke up to the top side. It moved several hundred pips. Had you had only had your orders on the short side, you would have missed one of the best trades on the Euro Swiss franc prior to the peg losing that 120 level earlier last year. So can everybody see the significance of placing orders in both directions? You don't know what's going to happen next. You must prepare yourself for either eventuality. And Scott, you're saying you didn't know you could do both. Absolutely, Scott. You're not entering the market on two sides. You're not going long and short at the same time. All you're doing is you're placing an order so that if the market goes up, you're in or if the market goes down you're in you're not long and short at the exact same time all you're doing is you're allowing for either eventuality to occur and when either eventuality does indeed occur then you don't have to think you don't have to worry about it that's exactly what we try to do that's exactly what we actually do in all of these examples the moral of the story with these triangles 
is that it is that congregation of the order flows, it is the, com the commitment which people are making which results in opportunities for us. It's the prices where people have traded. You know where they are losing. You know where they may panic. So what we've got to do is to wait for confirmation. Okay? We must wait for confirmation. For those who are asking how you might profit when you place an order on both sides, you just cover them through pending orders. You put pending orders in place. So if the market moves to one of the pending orders, then you come into the market and you cancel the one on the opposite side. We'll be showing you how to do this in a, a very practical sense tomorrow evening during lesson number seven. We'll be showing you how to place these pending orders. The key is that if the market does not move to one of the orders, well then you're not in the market. So you wait for the market to do what it should do before you actually do anything and those orders they do not cost you anything is that clear for all you use pending orders so that if the market goes to those levels you come in if it doesn't it's a bit like it's a bit like the market saying well you got it wrong so how could we charge you it never happened okay and no problem guys it was probably my own fault for not explaining it enough let's have a look quite quickly at another fantastic indicator which we really like here in the Academy of Financial Trading. The name of that indicator is the average true range. How many traders on this webinar, how many of you have used or have come across this webinar previously? The average true range. Let me have a look. Uh, Bavesha, you have. Um, Johan, you have. Great stuff. Fiona, you've used it. Rajini, Okay, most people, to be fair, most people who are new to trading, most have not heard of it, most have not used it. Uh, Benny, I can see you've used it. Great stuff. This is a fantastic indicator. It's, it's a bit like what the police would use as a speed gun to see how fast a car is traveling. But not only does it tell you the speed, but it also tells you the force. It tells you how heavy the vehicle might be. It tells you the momentum. What this indicator does is it simply measures the movement in price relative to time. Movement in price relative to time. So it'll measure the difference between the high and the low in the market. Not the start and the finish, but the high and the low. It's not the same as a moving average. It's an average true range. Pavesh, absolutely, to check the volatility. It'll take the average of the high and the low and it'll average it out over time. For example, it might tell you that the euro dollar is moving, let's say, 100 pips per day or 5 pips per hour or whatever that figure might be. And that's crucial when looking at the financial markets. It's crucial information. Let's look at this a little further. It's helpful because it tells you what markets conceivably might move. It can move large amounts or it can move small amounts. But it tells you what is possible. It tells you the changes in commitment. Okay? The changes in commitment. Let's have a look at it on a chart. This is a silver chart. Okay? So if you were imagine that l we are looking at today's activity, on that bottom left-hand corner, you can see there is a value of the ATR, and we'll be helping you or we'll be showing you how to apply this indicator again tomorrow evening during lesson number seven. And absolutely, Kenneth, we do use it as part of our risk analysis. Absolutely. But what that value does. You can see the number 10 written after ATR. So you can see ATR, 10 in brackets, and then there is a value of 0 0.2305. So what that is telling us is that as far as volatility is concerned, the silver market has been moving 0 0.2305 per day over the past 10 days. The reason why it is in a daily sense is because it's a daily candlestick chart. 
If this was an hourly candlestick chart, and if that was still was a value of 10, it would be telling you how much the silver market has moved over the past 10 hours. If this was a weekly candlestick chart, it would be telling you how much the silver market has moved over the past 10 weeks. But you can dictate, you can vary that value, that 10, to whatever you wish it to be. You can have it as an 8 to your 2, as an 8 to your 5, 10, 100, whatever the case may be. In this example, we've just taken it that the ATR equals 10. So it's giving us the average true range, the volatility which has existed in this market over the past 10 days. It is that difference between the high and the low. Okay, It's not talking about open positions and closed positions. It's just talking about the difference between the high and the low. And it's averaged it out over the the past 10 days. Why we like this so much is because it helps us to decide where we should place our stop losses. It helps us, it literally shows us whether or not we are wrong in our analysis. So let's have a look and see how it does that. This exact same chart. Imagine this was today. Imagine the latest candlestick, even though it's from the end of last year. Imagine that was today. And imagine we had said to ourselves that we were going to get in at the highest point of the day. So we got in right at the upper end of that week where that dashed black line has been drawn. Okay, at that, where that dashed black line has been drawn. Now if you just put your stop loss at let's say one times at just the value of 0 0.2305. If you put in your stop loss at that level, your stop loss would be at the average volatility over the past 10 days. Okay, at the average volatility over the past 10 days. So if that is the average volatility, think of it like this. If that is the average volatility, do you think that there is a high possibility that your stop loss will be hit? If over the past 10 days, that has been the average volatility. Is there a high or a low possibility that your stop loss would be hit? Absolutely. It's a very high probability. And that's what happens to most retail traders. Do you ever stand back and do you ever wonder why your stop loss gets hit so often? The direction might be absolutely right. You might have gone long at that level. The market might eventually take off. But before it takes off, what happens to the vast amount of retail traders is that their stop loss gets hit. Their stop loss gets hit because they place their stop loss directly in the line of fire. They place their stop loss within a range which is just average volatility. So why not, why not maybe accept that? And why not say to ourselves, that's not what we want to do. So why not place our stop loss at twice the average volatility? Okay, let me just erase my scribble so we can make it clearer, okay? So let's imagine that first red line is just the average volatility multiplied by 1. And let's imagine that second red dash line is twice the average volatility. Can we all see that if we were to place our stop loss at twice the average volatility of the past 10 days, can you see the last time that level was hit? For example, we're talking about it has been at least four months. Am I right? Three months, three and a half months, whatever the case may be. That level, there was, that low level has not been hit for the last three, three and a half months. So now what is the probability of your stop loss being hit? What do you think? Now is there a high or a low probability of your stop loss being hit? So what you're doing is you're accepting the volatility which this market has within itself. You're accepting that you're not going to place your stop loss directly in the line of fire. Okay, you're accepting that if you place your stop loss a little bit further away, then you're giving the trade more scope. And now you're asking, isn't that too low? If the price goes down, don't we lose more? 
You absolutely should not lose more than I. You should not lose more. The point is, I guess that in the nicest of senses, we should be a little less greedy. Okay? So if we're to move our stop loss twice the distance away, what do you think we should do to our trade size? What do you think we should do to our trade size? And we're going to be covering this in a lot of detail during lesson number nine, this day next week during risk management. Basically, absolutely, I love everybody is saying that you should have it. Absolutely, if you're placing your stop loss twice the distance away, you should half your trade size. So you're actually risking the exact same amount. The risk is the exact same, you're just giving the trade more scope, more room to breathe, and therefore you're giving it a higher chance of performing in your favour. And that's what we like. And that's why that risk side of things is so important to us and why we spend so long covering it during lesson number nine. Okay, so if anybody's talking about not understanding the trade size types of thing, that's absolutely fine. You probably don't understand it because, and I don't mean to sound smart here, we haven't covered it yet, but I promise you we'll cover it in a huge amount more detail during lesson number nine. Now we're going to have a look at some oscillators. There are a huge number of oscillators which we could bring your attention to. Oscillators, they're indicators which are banded between two extremities. Examples are that MACD, that RSI obviously, that Percentage Williams, the Stochastic, the Commodity Channel Index. There's a huge range of oscillators from which we could choose. Basically, what they are, is they are values which are banded between two extremities, okay? And those two extremities are typically known as either an overbought extremity or an oversold extremity. An overbought extremity exists when people feel that the market has reached a top end, okay? The oversold extremity is when people feel that the price has gone down to a level from which it might bounce. So who in this webinar have come across these types of oscillators before? Who on this webinar has come across oscillators in any of its many variations before? Hans and Linwood and Adrian and uh, Chirendra, absolutely. And Hans, you're saying you use the MACD, no problem. Uh, John, you're using the MACD as well. Okay, quite a few have. So people believe that if a market goes above a top level of a stochastic into the overbought area, that the market must immediately reverse. They also believe that if the market goes down into the oversold area, it must again immediately reverse. But that's not the case. It can give you an indication as to the way the price is behaving, but it's not an out-and-out -out absolute confirmation. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the RSI. It's probably the most popular oscillator which is out there. But no matter which you might look at, no matter which you might prefer yourself, they all work off this same concept. So it is applicable to everything, okay? So the RSI, it is indeed, its function, its primary function is to try to decipher whether there is inherent strength or inherent weakness in the marketplace, okay? There are a couple of values which we need to be aware of. It is said that if the market goes up to a level of 70 or above that, that anybody who's looking at their RSI, they might favor selling the market because they don't feel it's going to go any further. And then the opposite side of the coin is if the RSI moves down below a value of 30, then its followers might prefer to take the long side of the trade. They would prefer to buy that market. What we would always say with these indicators is that it take them for what they are called. You can consider them fair enough to be an indicator, but it is not a sign of confirmation, not at all, not by any stretch of the imagination. And absolutely nobody should use them as that standalone style, at that standalone reason to trade, if you like. 
okay so a quick example we have the values over here on the right hand side the lower end of the screen so this is the rsi indicator and again tomorrow evening during lesson number seven we'll be showing you how to apply this rsi or any such oscillator to the chart but we can see in the green arrow which we've we've placed first i guess over on the left side is we can see that this red line this rsi value it is broken up above that level of 30 so it's saying you should buy the market so if you did that it would actually worked out quite well for you you would have bought the market and the high likelihood is that you would have stayed in the trade all the way until you broke down from that 70 level and then you would have sold so would you would have seen a reasonable gain in the market that's absolutely fine so matthew you're asking over 70 what is considered overbought any level over 70 as long as it's over 70 people comment or people opinion or opine that it is overbought and that it is likely to sell off another example on silver again we can see the same type of scenario we can see that it is overbought at that level of 70 there's a higher chance that it will fall the rsi is falling and the market indeed does fall and then it says you should buy it once it moves back above that 30 level which is what it does okay which is what it does for anybody asking are they 70 watts what is 70 what does 70 stand for what is 30 what does 30 stand for the calculations which go into measuring the rsi it's genuinely much too cumbersome and mohit and everybody else who's asking and michael and christian and matthew everybody else who's asking uh, what exactly it stands for genuinely it is it is uh, much too cumbersome to go into um during this evening's class for a great explanation though on any of these oscillators whether it is a macd or an rsi or a stochastic or a percentage williams go on to wikipedia wikipedia is a fantastic resource for any queries which you might have from a trading perspective anything to do with these terms anything to do with the calculations of them it is a fantastic resource it goes through and um, the calculations it goes through where the values are derived from and for any maths geeks uh, maybe a little bit like myself um, it tends to be quite useful okay so by all means go on to that and check it out I prefer Wikipedia to Investopedia. If I'm being honest with you, Sean, anybody else has typed in Investopedia, uh, Bavesh, I think as well. I prefer Wikipedia than Investopedia. Okay, so we also have our criticism of these oscillators. Okay, and a good criticism might be this exact point which we're looking at here on the US dollar Swiss franc chart. You would have sold at that breakdown of that 70 level because you would have said the market is now worth both if you had sold that at that level just based upon the valuation which the rsi had been giving you would have not only have placed a trade in the wrong direction but you would have also have missed that 400 pip move to the upside it's the exact same move which we saw earlier on it's the exact same move where we saw that ascending triangle where we saw the breach of resistance and a strong move beyond that resistance point for that same trade the rsi was saying you should sell it okay so if you're only dependent upon one element if you're only dependent upon one indicator to tell you what you should do you can see how dangerous it is to use that one indicator as absolute confirmation we prefer to wait for a number of different confirmation a number of different signals to tell us what we should do another criticism we can see it here in the hong kong 50 the hong kong index the hang saying isn't it where again you would tell you to buy at that breakout and fair enough initially you might have said you know what we're going in the right direction this is good i bought at the breakout times are good but what happened then would have been horrific not only the wrong direction but you would have missed a sizable move in the opposite direction a 3500 pip move all the while when the oscillator was telling you that you should buy okay the biggest criticism to this not only is that you're in the wrong direction not only are you missing a sizable move but the chances are that the retail trader would tend to buy more and more and more aggressively because it is not until this point here if you like where it moves back down below 30 where they've already missed 
a m very big chunk of the move, it's not until that point you're living in a time where you're looking at one solid month of a trade going against you. It's not, not certainly not a nice position to be in. So that's one of the reasons why we don't take these indicators as being an overriding signal. Okay, when you're looking at something like this Dow Jones market, okay, you have the oscillator going above 70, you have a signal to sell, but at the same time you have that massive bullish engulfing candle. Okay, not only that, you have a couple of days of sideways trading after that, then you have another bullish engulfing pattern. And it's only then at that top level where you have an inverted hammer, where you have a couple of dojos, where you have another hammer, and then you have a bearish engulfing pattern. Maybe you should couple a few of those things together. You have a resistance point. You have the failure of an ascending triangle. So it's when you're looking at something like this, where you're able to string a couple of different resources together to show you exactly what is happening in the market, this is telling us what we are looking for much more than any one standalone signal can give us. Okay, so you should not take this alone into example. You should look at what is happening in the market. You should look at one piece of confirmation, that bullish engulfing candle. You should look at a second piece of confirmation, that second bullish engulfing candle. Even you could say that's a third one. Then you have a clear sign that the market might be topping out. You have a couple of hammers. You have a couple of dojis. Then you've got that bearish engulfing pattern. So you string all of these together, all of these separate signals together, and it gives you a much better understanding of exactly what is happening in the market. And that's what we try to do. We try to look at that overall picture and not be reliant upon any one oscillator, any one type of automatic indicator, which so many retail traders use. That's not what we like to do. It's certainly not what we're about. Okay? Now let's have a look at the Fibonacci retracements. Again, I'll ask who has come across Fibonacci retracements before. Has anybody looked at it? Anybody used it? Anybody used this type of indicator before? Dibbe, you're saying you've heard of it. Who else? Ricky, you've used it. Dan Brown says Vilma. Yeah, Dan Brown mentioned it in one of his books, didn't he? So Fibonacci, they were developed by this fine gentleman who he believed in the in the natural universal proportions which existed. There was an idea which was supported by some natural evidence and otherwise that everything is interconnected. Okay, that there is a relationship between leaves and the branches of trees, that there is relationships between parts of your body and other parts of your body, which we won't go into right now. You see, what then happened was a group of mathematical traders, they began applying Fibonacci's to charts. Now, why is this important to us? It's important because a lot of people now use it. A lot of people apply the Fibonacci retracement to the charts because they believe that it's going to predict the future. And it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? A self-fulfilling prophecy that a lot of people then start trading using these tools and that results in opportunities. Now, a huge amount of retail traders trade in this way. That then means that these are of interest to us because we want to know what the retail trader is doing. We want to know exactly what they are doing so we can try to trade against them. So we use these indicators in a counter retail trading manner. So don't worry about whether you think that the world is interconnected by a particular number sequence. Don't throw away any spirituality which you might have because of these numbers. We're certainly not here to preach from a religious perspective. This is just something which traders use, which helps us because it tells us where they are in the marketplace. There are certain numbers like a 50% retracement, like a 38.2% retracement, like a 61.8% retracement, where they show their hand, where they show the congregation of retail traders and their orders. What we need to do is we need to paint a picture on a chart of exactly what we mean. So let's try to maybe keep the focus as to where those individual, where those retail traders stop losses are. That's what will help us. Because what we need to understand, I suppose, to begin with, 
is that a retail trader, they're certainly more of an optimist than they are of a pessimist. Okay, they are more of an optimist than they are of a pessimist. That's why we always see more panic existing when the market is selling off. The retail trader tends to take the buy side of the trade, the long side of the trade, more often than not. But how you apply this to a chart is you find an obvious low point. And again, tomorrow evening when we're going through lesson number seven, we'll be, I suppose, identifying these types of obvious low points. I understand it's one thing for me to say it, and it's another thing for you to understand it, but we find an obvious low point in the chart. We find an obvious high point on the chart. And then we just apply our Fibonacci tool to it. A Fibonacci tool, it's an automatic tool with the trading platform. The best way of explaining this is imagine that this low point is the office that I'm currently in. Okay, imagine it's the office and imagine the high point is maybe a restaurant or a bar or something where I'm going to go after this evening's webinar and I'm going to go have my dinner. Okay, if I, let's say, got to that restaurant and then I discovered that I forgot my wallet. Okay, if I journeyed 50% of the way back to the office to pick up my wallet, you'd say there was a 50% retracement. Okay, if I only journeyed 23.6% of the way back, you would say there was a 23.6% retracement, or 38.2, or 61.8, or whatever the case may be. What makes these areas of importance to us is that we can use them to identify where the retail traders are placing their failed trades. And we can see exactly that it's not by coincidence that the points are hit. We can see there is a massive congregation of orders at that 50% level that the price bounces off it. And then we can see when it gets to 23.6% that it bounces from it. It acts as a ceiling. And we can see those same type of bounces time and time and time again off those same levels. When there is a substantial breach, we can see the panic which exists until a new level is formed. And they're all formed around those retracement levels. They're all formed all around those levels. And that's what makes it that self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? That's what makes it that self-fulfilling prophecy. So many people use this Fibonacci retracement tool as a way to trade. So many retail traders place their orders at these retracement levels. So many orders are there that when they fail, we see the panic which exists. It is that self-fulfilling prophecy. It might sound daft to some people. I absolutely get that. It does sound daft to me as well. But that's what makes it that self-fulfilling prophecy. And again, we look at it in that gold example. We have an obvious high point. We have an obvious low point. We string the Fibonacci tool between the two. And we see the different retracement areas which are automatically brought up by that Fibonacci tool. And anybody who's looking at the gold market right now, you should know that the gold market is currently trading around about that 23.6% level, isn't it? It's trading around about that 23.6% level. It's trading somewhere between that 1085 and 1090 level. Again, down to that self-fulfilling prophecy which Fibonacci gives us because the retail traders are placing their failed trades at those levels. There's nothing more, I suppose, no more thinking, if you like, needs to go into it. People tend to overthink this Fibonacci tool more often than not. There's not a massive amount of thought which need to go, needs to go into it, other than the fact that retail traders use it. We simply use it as a way to find the retail traders. We need to envisage those participants as a way of finding our opportunity. It shows us and it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. What we want to do this evening, we're pretty much going to end up bang on the hour for a change. So what we want to do is we want to have a look at a chart. We want to make a decision as to what might be about to happen. This is a current Yahoo chart. It's seen a little bit of misfortune of late, I guess, from the latter end of, well, the latter end of December right into even the start of this year. We've seen a little bit of a drop in price. But looking at this chart right here, right now, can you make a decision as to what you might do? 
There are a huge amount of gaps, absolutely, because Yahoo is quite a volatile stock, isn't it? You have a lot of people talking about Marissa Meyer and her vision for the company and the amount of employees that they should let off. And then you've got institutional investors coming out and saying to the traders what they would do if they were in charge. And I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, gosh, the name escapes me now. What's the name? Alibaba, excuse me, Alibaba, the huge amount of of um, investment which they have put into Alibaba. Alibaba, the investment which Yahoo have made in Alibaba is now more valuable than Yahoo themselves pretty much. But if we think about what we've covered this evening, we had an ascending triangle. We had an area which showed us that the bulls appear to be in charge, didn't we? So people would have been pressing the market higher. There would have been a lot of optimism that it should have broken clear above that ceiling between $35 and $36. But it didn't break above that ceiling. Okay, it pushed down. People panicked. People exited the market. They rushed for the exit doors in droves. They created a couple of gaps along the way. And now we have a clear descending channel. We have a channel, we still have the price which is bound between a supportive area and a resistance area, but it is certainly moving south. Absolutely certainly moving south. So at this point in time, we'll give an answer for a change. We're probably going to stand on the sideline. you would probably wait and see how it reacts with a previous low level if indeed it gets that far. But again, as always, patience is the key. It's always important when you're looking at a chart to just analyze it for a while. Wait and see what it's doing. See if you can identify a clear supportive area. See if you can find a clear resistance area. Wait for it to interact with that area and then decide what you might do. But it is all about, it still comes back to the point that it is about trying to locate those congregation of orders. It's about finding where the retail traders have placed their orders. We know, I know, you know, everybody knows that the vast amount of retail traders, they fail. They fail because they have not completed an educational course. They fail because they're trying to use trading as a way to get rich quick. Anybody who is in any way sensible knows that first off, there are very few things in life which can allow us to get rich quick. And the second thing is, you're never really going to get good at anything without a proper education. Okay, it's just not the case. So the next steps, a lot of people asking for the PowerPoints, not only from lessons one, two, three, four, for people who don't have access to Facebook, but also obviously for lesson five and lesson six from today. So we have come up with something for you to do, okay? Something a little bit unusual maybe, but we want to get a little bit of feedback from you guys. So we want you to go onto our Show Academy page. We are part of Show Academy, obviously. Show Academy is our parent company. Show Academy not only provides um, education on trading, but also education on another huge, diverse range of subjects. What we'd like you to do is, I suppose, conduct a little bit of a survey amongst ourselves. If you just email your support manager with a suggestion of any course which is not yet available within Show Academy, will make the PowerPoints from Lesson 1 all the way through to tonight, Lesson 6, available to you. So if it's something related to trading, if you'd see, like to see a course specific to, to foreign exchange, if you'd like to see a course specific to commodities, if you'd like to see an investment course, well, I suppose, thankfully, we have an investment course in the works at the moment, but if you'd like to see a course on cookery, if you'd like to see a course on how to learn Chinese, Whatever the case may be, if it's trading related, fantastic. If it's not trading related, if it's something else, something completely different, just pop through an email to your support manager with a suggestion of any course which you would like to see in Show Academy. And if you do that, we'll provide you with the PowerPoints from the lessons of the Foundation Trading Program up to date, absolutely up to date without anything else needing to be done. So hopefully that's fair enough. Hopefully that's fair enough. And we absolutely value your feedback. We absolutely, uh, absolutely, look, we are using this, I guess, as a bit of a survey, aren't we? But we absolutely value your feedback. We'd love to hear what you guys think would be valuable to you. So the next session is tomorrow. Don't forget, it's three in a row this week. So do come back tomorrow where we'll be looking at a practice this trading platform will be showing you how to access your own practice trading platform and how to use 
that practice trading platform in a risk-free environment where you're going to be able to practice what you are t being taught. We're going to be able to show you how to access the markets, how to place pending orders, how to place um, a lot of those types of instruments which we've looked at to date, um, how to look at the candlesticks, how to change colors of the candlesticks, how to change the charts, how to change the graphs, how to find specific markets, whatever the case may be. And then two days time, we are coming back for lesson number eight, which is on counter retail trading, where we're going to be showing you exactly what we do in order to trade the markets. We'll be showing you exactly the processes which we have in place in order to successfully trade the market. And don't forget as well, during lesson number eight and two this time, we will indeed be announcing the winner of the competition. We'll be ta talking about, or talking to hopefully, that person who has won lifetime membership to Show Academy. So what I'll do now, a little a little past the hour, is I'll take my usual 30 seconds or so. Um, I'll give you the opportunity to type in any outstanding questions which you might have. And I'll come back in about 30 seconds after I've gargled a bit of water, given my throat a bit of a rest. And I'll go through as many questions as I have, guys. So I'll speak to you in about 30 seconds. Many, many thanks. Okay, guys, let's have a look. Ba, 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 ba. Michael, you're saying, could you touch on what you mean when you mention pending? Yeah, Michael, I suppose pending is just like placing an order in advance. Okay, so let's imagine that oil was trading at $30 even. You could say to yourself, okay, I believe that there are a lot of people selling at $30. Okay, so it's pushing the market further down. So you might say, okay, I also feel that if the market was to move to $31, that people who are selling at $30 would be panicking. They'd be exiting. So there is a chance that it will rise if it goes, it'll rise further if it goes to 31. So I want to place an order so that if the market gets to 31, that I want to go long. And likewise, you might say, okay, I can see a range between $30 and $28. So I also know that if the market moves down to $27, anybody who's bought at 28 will be losing. They'll be panicking, they'll be exiting, they'll be fleeing the market. So if it goes to $27, I want to place an order that I will sell the market. So now you've two pending orders. The price isn't at one or the other, but the price will move to one or the other. You have your orders set in advance so that when it moves to one or the other, that's activated and you cancel the other order. You're not charged for any specific, you're never ever charged. You're, you, well, you should not be charged. If a broker is to charge you for placing a pending order, simply forget about that broker, move on to somebody else. There is no, or with any reputable broker, they will never charge you for placing an order, placing a pending order, okay, at any level. They will not charge you for it. You can edit that order as often as you like. You can delete that order. You can reinstate that order. Whatever you tend, whatever you wish to do. But we'll be showing you actually how to place those orders tomorrow evening. And then during lesson number eight, we'll be showing you exactly what we do. So hopefully that will help. Um, ba -da -ba -bam. Robert, you're saying when you trade using RSIs, would it always be wise to trade with a pending order to cover? Again, Robert, I suppose you, you kind of have it absolutely, but we don't trade using RSIs. It's just too unreliable. It's not a good enough indicator as far as we are concerned. Um, let me have a look. Do, 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 do. Bavish, you're saying, do you think that there are institutional orders pending at certain locations on those charts? Absolutely, Bavish. And that's what we try to do, I guess. We try to follow those institutional orders. Those institutional orders, they occur at the same levels at the 
opposite side of the retail traders. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, I guess, to anything to any great extent. What we're trying to do is literally follow the more successful entities. OK, that's all we're doing. We're trying to follow the more successful entities. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Let me have a look. Um, well, let me have a look. Let me have a look. How many active retail traders are out there, John? John, that's a, a needle in a haystack question, I'm afraid. I would honestly have no idea. I would honestly have no idea. Um, Bavesh, you're asking about CRT. That's counter retail trading. What else? Jeremiah, you're asking, would it be wise to use several indicators at one time? Yeah, again, other people go for that approach, Jeremiah. It's not bad, but at the same time, we're not massive fans of it either because there can then be uh, a need, if you like, for a perfect storm to occur in order for a valid trade to exist. That it has to be X, Y, Z and A, B, C and D, E, F has to occur in a perfect sequence in order for you to place a trade. You'll see, I suppose, in much clearer detail exactly what we do during lesson number eight. But we feel that there has to be, uh, in a way, maybe an overriding indicator, if that's even the best way to, to describe it, an overriding indicator, which gives you ultimate conf confirmation as to whether or not something might happen. That's what we prefer to do. And that's what we will be showing you during lesson number eight and onwards from there again. Um, what else have I got? Stephen P, you're asking how do you leave feedback on the Show Academy website? I don't know if it's um if it's if it's possible to do it on the website, Stephen. We took a conscious decision of that, I guess, because we were uh, we were mindful of the fact um, that when a review when a review option is available within a website that we might own. Um, that it leaves the door open for people to say, well, you're only putting the good ones up or where are all the bad ones or whatever the case may be. So we prefer to have it up in a kind of a more open environment. So we use Facebook um, for that purpose. We can't edit Facebook. Um, we can't, you know, if somebody puts up uh, something that we don't really like on Facebook, it's up to us to improve. It's nothing that we can do to to, to hide it, if you like. So if you go on to facebook.com slash academyft, I think slash review, um, you'll be able to, leave a review there if you wish and and we'll be able to see it and no problem whatsoever it'll help us improve absolutely fine um let me have a look da, 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 da. Liarta, you're asking is it mandatory to finish the quizzes not not at all Liarta, it's not mandatory at all only if you wish it's there for your own um for for you maybe to get a little bit of confidence Liarta. it's there for you to see how well you are doing it's there for you to understand the progress that you're making um that's why it's there um, but Yarta, you're also asking if you can live out of trading and not work that much. Absolutely, Yarta, absolutely. Um, but we think that it's, I said, well, honestly, it's better to be a little bit more realistic. I don't know anybody who has started trading today and been able to retire next month. It's about um, anything else in life. I tend to compare it more often than not to learning how to play guitar or something like that. You know, a lot of us might want to learn how to play an instrument. A lot of us might go as far as going into a music store putting down some money walking out with the guitar after you do that there's no point in in um, ringing up the organizers of Glastonbury and telling them that you want the headline slot the following year it doesn't happen like that okay you need to practice you need to um, be aware that there's no point in running before you can walk um, but you know that's kind of what trading is about or, or any other pursuit is about Okay, it's about applying yourself, it's about getting better at it, it's about, uh, you know, accessing the right education, which thankfully you're doing, um, and then, you know, just continuing on and allowing yourself to gain a little bit of confidence and to build up and to, to understand that it does provide you with a, a consistent and a conservative return. That's what we tend to focus on, absolutely. Um, uh, but uh, 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 Ragu, apologies, I've missed your question. If you wouldn't mind typing it in again, I'll do my best to get back to it before we finish up. Then I yeah, will be talking through, I suppose, reputable brokers and how to identify them as we progress as well, specifically maybe during lesson number nine. Um, let me have a look. You're okay, Ragu, you're asking how can we come to know about buy or sell with Fibonacci retracements? Um, yeah, it's just again the congregation of orders at those specific Fibonacci levels, Ragu. Um, 
you know, it's it's about the retail trader typically being an optimist more than a pessimist. It's about the retail trader tending to believe that the price will bounce at those individual levels if it's working its way down. Um, and then obviously to be aware of the retail trader believing that and then to be able to take advantage of the movement when there is a breach of those specific levels. But again, we'll be showing you how to go through that. We'll be showing you how to apply the Fibonacci tool tomorrow. And we'll be showing you then maybe how to understand it a little more. And then following on the following day during lesson number eight, um, we'll be showing you how exactly we go about our trading. Um, let me have a look. Do, 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 do. Yeah, Vishal, you're talking about Fibonacci. You're saying, the, why would we blindly follow this? There's no real logic behind it. Yeah, I'd agree to a huge extent, Vishal. Um, that's what makes it, I suppose, that, that um, uh, oh, what do we call it? It's, um, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So many people believe it, so many people do it, um, that it just becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, let me have a look. Frank, you're asking, what's the share of the retail trader in trading volume? I'd say it's quite low, Frank, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't know, again, the exacts. But one thing we do know is that the retail traders, they do not possess the majority of the capital. Um, I think we covered this earlier on. Is it during lesson number four, maybe, or so? Um, that we understand that retail traders, they're the vast amount of traders but they possess the least amount of capital. They can't move the markets. We can't move the markets. It's only the institutional traders, the big boys, the brokers, the market makers. They move the market. So we prefer to follow the people who move the market. Okay, let me have a look. Yeah, Minesh and a few other people have asked who their support manager is. If you're not sure, just pop through an email to support at academyft.com. No problem whatsoever. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Mohit, when I say the retail traders are optimistic, yeah, I mean they're bullish. Absolutely, Mohit. I should have said bullish. That retail traders, they tend to believe that no matter what is happening, that prices will rise. That prices will rise. Um, let me have a look. Ba -ba -ba -ba. What have we got? Um, let me have a look. Do, 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 do. I'm just scrolling up. Sud uh, Sujit, excuse me. Um, you're asking if all brokers deal in all markets. No, not at all. Some brokers, they are very specific. They would tend to provide maybe only a range of forex markets. Other brokers might only provide a range of um, uh, of equity markets or whatever the case may be. It's the forex markets who would tend to be the more popular ones. But we feel it's good to have a, a, a good, broad, diverse range of markets within which you can trade. Um, Elaine, you're asking about market makers. What is a market maker? Um, a market maker is a, a broker who provides you with a trading platform, Elaine, but instead of providing you with the real price of the markets, which moves as market forces dictate, they're providing you with, the, if you like, a mirror of the markets. They're providing you with their own interpretation of what that market is doing, of the price which exists within that specific market. And because they are providing you with their own interpretation, they can move that market as they see fit. Okay, they're not moving the physical, actual market. They're only moving the market which they have provided you with access to. And that's what the majority of, of brokers out there are doing. And there's, you know what, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Their license would allow them to do it. If you were to look them up under whichever regulation or whichever regulator they are regulated by, you will see that they are allowed to do it. No problem whatsoever. Um, we prefer to go with a broker who is not a market maker, however. We'd prefer to go with a broker who ha gives you access directly to the actual market so you know the price is a true price, an honest price, a fair price. Yeah, ECN, Bavesh, same kind of idea. STP, a uh, straight through processor, or ECN, absolutely. Uh, but again, we'll be going through this in a lot more detail as we progress. Um, but a, but let me have a look. 
Um, Mihoma, you're asking if you can get the support email address. Yeah, hopefully it's on the screen there. If you look up in the top right-hand corner of the screen, you should be able to see it there. Support at academyft.com. And uh, Diana, you're asking when will you be able to see the candlesticks and place actual trades? Do all trading companies allow viewing on the candlesticks? Yeah, the the vast, vast, vast majority do, Diana. I've come across maybe only one or two. Um, in my experience, who do not allow, um, who do not provide candlestick viewings, um, but thankfully there's so many out there that do that you're not reliant upon the few that do not. Okay, and we'll be going through that tomorrow evening with you. Tomorrow evening with you. Mark, you're asking what do I think about guaranteed losses? That's a sure sign of a market maker, Mark, if I'm being completely honest with you. If a, if a broker is able to guarantee a stop loss, it, it just can't be done unless they are the ones providing you with the price. If they're providing you with an artificial price, you cannot guarantee a price unless you are the market. Okay, so it's a sure sign of a market maker. Um, let me have a look. Do, 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 do. Let me have a look. Johan, excuse me, Johan, if I've missed your question. Um, what else have we got? Do, 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 do. I'm just doing a bit of scrolling here to see what I have missed. If any apologies, guys, if I have missed your specific question, hopefully the support team were able to pick it up. Um, yeah, no trouble at all, guys. Many thanks for your kind words. Um, Michael, you're asking, will we discuss trades other than breakouts or breakdowns, momentum and short-term price action? Yeah, Michael, we'll be going through a lot more as we progress. You know, we're just over 50% of the way there. We're actually 60% of the way there, obviously, from this evening. Uh, so we still have quite a bit of ground to cover, absolutely. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Let me have a look. Uh, no trouble at all, Christian. Many, many thanks. Uh, Mohit, you're asking, where do we look for news, if at all? Yeah, I tend to go to the usual places, Mohit, no different than anybody else if I'm interested in some news item about a particular movement whether it's Bloomberg or CNBC or Reuters or or Squawk Box or Forex Factory or any one of those um, no problem whatsoever um, Paramesh, yeah, no trouble at all. We can give you a buzz anytime which might suit. I'm sure we'll be able to set it up. Again, if you pop us through an email, um, we'll be happy to talk whenever it might suit you. Mark, many thanks, no trouble whatsoever. Johan, you're asking, how can you, can you identify a true confirmation? We'll be going through that during lesson number eight specifically, Johan, if that's okay. Um, Paul, you're asking, what's the best way to invest in oil? Can you invest in it directly? Or do you have to invest in a company that relies on oil? No, you should be able to trade it directly, Paul. You should be able to to trade either uh, West Texas, the American oil, the WTI, or you should be able to trade North Sea oil, which is the Brent crude. Um, no trouble, Charles. Many, many thanks. Um, Guri, yeah, type in your question. Hopefully, I'll have time to come back and have a look at it. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Adam, you're asking if I recommend doing the opposite of what many mainstream media com uh, commentators suggest. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing the opposite of it, Adam, but I think it's important to point out that the vast majority of those mainstream media commentators, they have a vested interest. OK, if you're talking about CNBC, if you're talking about Bloomberg, like, you know, if, if you're talking about Bloomberg specifically, let's say, or you talk about even Fox News, like we know the people who own these companies. Bloomberg is owned by Michael Bloomberg. Um, his wealth is derived from his company doing well, from the markets doing well. Um, the same as Fox. Like Fox obviously is owned by the Murdochs. The Murdochs um, are, uh, are interested in the markets going upwards in the right direction. Um, like, do you honestly think that anybody employed by either of those two individuals, and it's not fair that I'm pointing out just those two individuals. CNBC, the exact same. CNBC, it was owned by General Electric. I'm not sure. I don't think they still own it, but it is owned by yet another publicly listed company. Like any commentator on the vast majority of those financial channels, they have a vested interest in talking the markets up. And that's uh, that's why you feel like I, uh, another reason as to why I don't like listening to them. Okay, if you're reliant upon somebody who's always going to tell you that the market is going to rise because it is in their favor to tell you that, you know, just turn off the radio if you like. Just don't listen to them and um, use your own analysis and um, that will see you wrong a lot less.
Um, Gauri, sorry, you're asking about stop loss orders. Do you base it on a daily ATR, a weekly ATR, a monthly ATR, or a yearly ATR? Um, I, we always use a daily candlestick chart, Gauri. That's, I suppose, the best answer to that question. We always use a daily candlestick chart. Um, let me have a look. Do, 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 do. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. Uh, Howard, you're asking, is the Fibonacci tool an actual physical device or is it a computer module or selection of a chart display that you can request? Yeah, I, um, again, tomorrow evening we'll hopefully clear all that up for you, Howard. But it is an automatic tool that's located within most, if not all, trading platforms. But we will indeed show you how to do it uh, tomorrow evening. Um, Bavesh, yeah, um, that gentleman in particular, absolutely. Um, he's known, I suppose, for talking the wrong side of the trade, pretty much. Um, but -da -da -da. let me have a look. Frank S. Uh, so the real pros seem to win both with rising and falling markets. Um, yeah, look, um, you know, it's it's always good to not limit yourself to one side of the market, Frank. You know, if the market is rising, you should buy. If the market's falling, you should sell. You know, there are too many people out there who say that they just want to buy the market. And there's too many people out there who say they just want to sell the market. You know, if the market is rising, if it's giving you enough confirmation to say, yeah, I want to be part of that rising move, then you should buy. And likewise, if that market stops rising and starts to fall and it's giving you enough confirmation that the market is going to continue to fall, then you should sell it. You know, so it's, it's important for us, I guess, that we have access to both buying and selling. Um, let me have a look. Um, let me have a look. Let me have a look. Uh, I think that's about it, guys. I think that's about it. Um, yeah, we'll be providing you all with those, with our, our showing you how to access that practice, practice trading platform from tomorrow. No problem. Uh, the recordings are accessible right through until I believe it's the week after the entire course comes to an end. So two weeks more that you can access the recordings. Um, I think that's about it, guys. Look, apologies if I have missed out on anything else. If I have, please do continue to type in and we'll do our best to get back to you during the support side of things. If not, please do just pop us through a quick email um, and tell us what we've missed out on. We'll absolutely make it our business to get back to you, provide you with a full answer. But until tomorrow evening, when we will be on a practice platform, we'll be going through that in a huge amount of detail. We certainly look forward to that. Until tomorrow evening, don't forget that it is tomorrow evening that you are coming back. Um, we look forward to speaking to you then, guys. In the meantime, I hope you had an enjoyable start to the week and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Many thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Now, I'm not saying I don't like kids. I like kids. I have fun hanging out with my friends' kids and joking around with them, whatever. They're great. But I do feel like when I talk to my friends that recently had kids, it does seem like they had to give up everything for the kid. And that's very scary. You want to have a depressing conversation? Talk to a couple that just had a kid. Ask them about the last night they went out for themselves. They will describe the most boring, typical, mundane evening out 